uh, see steam nozzle that can be that can be of two different type depending on its geometry and mode of operation one is convergent nozzle and another is convergent divergent nozzle let us first understand the working principle of a convergent nozzle in a convergent nozzle the area of the nozzle that reduces gradually in the direction of flow as the area reduces then the flow velocity will increase and from Bernoulli's principle we will have a decrease in pressure. So, the lowest pressure will be at the exit of the nozzle and at the same time we will have the highest velocity at the exit of the nozzle. At the inlet of the nozzle we are having a pressure which is denoted by P1. <coughs> Generally the velocity of the fluid is, is negligibly small at the inlet of the nozzle. So, that is why sometimes this P1 is also denoted as P s or stagnation pressure. Whereas, the pressure at the <coughs> exit of the nozzle is called back pressure. Now, when a compressible fluid passes through the nozzle, we find a very unique phenomenon which is shown in this curve or graph. So, here <coughs> what we have done, we have used the mass flow rate through the nozzle as one ordinate and in the another ordinate we are having we are having the back pressure and the back pressure we have expressed in a non dimensional form where <coughs> we have used the ratio of back pressure to the stagnation pressure. So, so the back pressure it can be lower than the stagnation pressure or at the best it could be equal to the stagnation pressure. So, the maximum possible value of back pressure could be 1 that is what I have shown here. The value of back pressure can never be more than 1 in case of a nozzle. Now, when the back pressure value that means this non-dimensionalized non back pressure value is 1 or the back pressure is equal to the stagnation pressure, then there is no flow through the nozzle because at the inlet of the nozzle you are having a pressure equal to P s and at the outlet of the nozzle you are having the same pressure equal to P s. So, that is why there is no flow through the nozzle, mass flow rate through the nozzle is equal to 0. Then what you are doing? You are decreasing the back pressure or you are decreasing the ratio P b by P s, you are moving in this direction of the coordinate. So, as the back pressure is reducing keeping P s the same value, then you will have some flow rate through this nozzle. So, that is what you can see that as you go on decreasing the back pressure, you are having higher and higher rate of mass flow through the nozzle. But in case of compressible flow what will happen that this mass flow rate will go on increasing, it will come to a high value at some point and after that there is no change in the mass flow rate. So, <coughs> it seems as if the nozzle has got choked and this condition is known as choking condition because beyond this whatever may be the decrease of back pressure. Suppose at this point you have made your back pressure equal to 0, even then you do not get any increase in the mass flow rate. So, this is known as the choked condition of the nozzle or critical condition of the nozzle. So, this ratio is the critical pressure ratio P b by P s star that is the critical pressure ratio and this m dot at this corresponding condition denoted by m dot star is the critical mass flow rate through the nozzle. Physically what happens? Physically at this condition when you attain this critical pressure ratio, the velocity at the exit plane of the nozzle is the local sonic velocity or velocity of sound. 
So, you cannot increase the fluid velocity beyond that if you have a nozzle geometry like this. So, here you are having velocity of sound that is the maximum velocity in the nozzle and you cannot increase this velocity as you cannot increase this velocity. So, <coughs> upstream point also this velocity remains fixed and the mass flow rate through the nozzle that remains fixed. In other words, once you reach the criti critical condition at every point the state of the fluid and the velocity that remains fixed, you cannot change it by changing the back pressure. All right. So, at critical point and beyond critical point you are having the fixed value of flow rate and fixed value of fluid velocity. Now, why do we use a nozzle? We use a nozzle to create to create high velocity flow, high velocity jet. So, we can see that this nozzle has got a limitation. Also, we want to have nozzle through which high mass flow rate is possible. So, in that regard also we find that this nozzle has a limitation with respect to mass flow rate and with respect to fluid velocity we have got limitation in this nozzle. So, <coughs> that is why other designs of nozzles are looked into. If we go for convergent divergent type of nozzle, let us say our design is something like this. this is a convergent divergent type of nozzle. This is the nozzle axis. Here again you are having stagnation pressure and here you are having the back pressure. So, this is your convergent divergent nozzle. Now, in this case what will happen? <coughs> the phenomenon in the convergent portion is same as we have discussed earlier. That means, the pressure at the inlet of the nozzle which is denoted as P s, this is the stagnation pressure, you are keeping this pressure constant and you are changing the back pressure, you are gradually reducing the back pressure. So, the phenomenon just like before will take place. That means, you will have higher and higher flow rate through the nozzle and the velocity will also increase. Where the velocity will increase? The velocity will increase in the convergent portion. If we see the nozzle, there are three portion of the nozzle. First one is the convergent portion, one is the convergent portion, two that is called the throat of the nozzle and 3, this is the divergent portion of the nozzle. So, one can write 1 is the convergent portion, 2 convergent portion or section, then 2 throat and 3 divergent section. Now, <coughs> if we see that the velocity 
we are going on reducing back pressure. So, velocity will go on increasing in the convergent section. Pressure will go on decreasing in the convergent section. In the divergent section, what will happen? Again, pressure will increase and velocity will fall. And maximum velocity in the nozzle, where we will get? We will get it at the throat. We will get at the throat the maximum amount of velocity. Now, this will continue as we go on decreasing back pressure. So, the throat velocity will go on increasing at one point it will be equal to the velocity of sound. Once it is equal to the velocity of sound, whatever decrease you may do in P b, whatever may be, whatever smaller may be the value of P b, no change will occur in the convergent section of the nozzle. So, in the convergent section of the nozzle, you will not have any change, but then you can find some unique changes in the divergent section of the nozzle. It can be shown by simple fluid mechanics that once the velocity is sonic velocity at the throat, after that if you reduce the back pressure, then the expansion will continue even in the divergent section and in the divergent section you will have further reduction in pressure and you will have further increase in velocity. That means, you will have supersonic velocity in the divergent section. <coughs> so, it is like this. If we represent it graphically, let us say this side we are representing pressure and this is the length of the nozzle L. So, let us say this is 2, this is 1 and this is 3. So, convergent section, throat and divergent section. And let us say this is the exit plane where the pressure is back pressure. So, <coughs> Initially, you are having the pressure is the stagnation pressure and this pressure you are keeping constant. So, what will happen? Initially, the back pressure is also equal to the stagnation pressure. So, there will not be any flow through the nozzle and everywhere in the nozzle you are having the same constant pressure. Then you have reduced the back pressure to this value. This is the plane for back pressure. So, let me call it P B. So, then you have reduced it here. So, what you will find up to throat, there will be reduction of pressure, but beyond throat, there will be increase in pressure. Up to throat, there will be increase in velocity, but beyond throat up to the exit there will be decrease in velocity. So, this will continue till you are having sonic velocity at the throat. After that again of course, here you will find that the pressure is increasing and velocity is decreasing. But let us say your back pressure is somewhere here. So, once you have reached the sonic velocity at the throat, after that if you reduce the back pressure further, there will not be any change 
in section 1 there will not be any change in section 1 and you will continue about the same line of expansion even in the divergent section 3. But you see if you proceed along this line you are going somewhere here, but you have kept the pressure here, so you cannot go here. So what will happen? You will go up to certain distance, then there will be a shock wave and you will come back here. All right. So this process will continue only if you put your back pressure at some value here, then you can proceed along this line and what advantage you are getting, then you are coming out of the nozzle with supersonic velocity. So, this point is known as the design back pressure of the convergent divergent nozzle and we want to operate it at this point only. So, what we are getting <coughs> if we operate at this point, we are getting maximum flow rate through the nozzle because at the throat you are having sonic velocity, we are having maximum velocity of the fluid at the outlet of the nozzle because in the divergent section the flow is supersonic. So, both the purpose it is fulfilling and steam nozzle which are convergent divergent nozzle they <coughs> we will try to operate those nozzle at this operating range. That means our <coughs> mass flow rate through the nozzle will be maximum and velocity at the outlet of the nozzle will be also maximum possible that is at supersonic range. So, in the steam turbine <coughs> mostly this convergent divergent type of nozzles will be used. All right. <coughs> now, the analysis of the nozzle already we have done that is not very difficult to do. whether it is a convergent divergent nozzle or it is a simple convergent nozzle. Let us say this is inlet I and this is exit E. So, <coughs> for the nozzle we can write down the steady state steady flow energy equation, <coughs> steady state steady flow energy equation. <coughs> we can write the steady state steady flow energy equation and the nozzle is well insulated. So, there is no work sorry heat transfer there is no work transfer also. So, with all this thing we can write H i plus V i square by 2 that is equal to H e plus V e square by or <coughs> in other words V e square by 2 that is equal to H i minus H e plus V i square by 2. Generally, this is small compared to the exit velocity compared to the change of enthalpy. So, V e is equal to twice H i minus H e and then this is under root. So, this is how we can determine what is the velocity through the nozzle. <coughs> if we see the process, okay, let us go to if we see the process either on a 
TS plane or on an HS plane, it is like this. Let us say this is HS plane. Sure. This is I and this is E. And basically, we have shown three <coughs> different pressure because this is the inlet or stagnation pressure, this is the back pressure, and this could be the pressure at the throat. All right. So, TS diagram will also be equally simple. So, something like this. So, this is I and this is E. That is how the steam expansion through a nozzle will be represented. Now, <coughs> this is ideal expansion of steam through the nozzle, where we are assuming that the process is isentropic but actually the process will not be isentropic. Uh, <coughs> first thing, there are some dissipative processes like there is friction. When steam will flow through the nozzle as it is a fluid and it is flowing through some sort of a solid passage, so there will be friction at the oval of the nozzle and whatever better, whatever uh, good may be the insulation of the nozzle, there will be there will be transfer of heat from the expanding steam to the ambient atmosphere. So, mainly these two will render the process irreversible and these two will render the pro I mean there will be change in entropy during the process due to these two effects. So, if there is change of entropy, how we can represent the process. Let us say we will try to represent it on a TS plane itself. So, this is your actual isentropic process. Now, let us say this is P i inlet pressure, this is P b and this is the condition from which steam is expanding. So, let us say this is i and I am denoting it as i h because it is a process through which s or entropy remains constant, but due to irreversibility, there will be increase in entropy. While the same steam is expanding from the same pressure to the same back pressure, same inlet pressure to the same back pressure, there will be increase in entropy. So, the exit point will be somewhere here. So, this is I and sorry, this is E s and this is E. So, E s represents the exit point if S remains con constant or entropy remains constant throughout the process and E is the exit point if there is irreversibility. So, actual expansion will take along this dotted line. We generally give this dotted line because we do not know the actual path, we know the initial point, we know the final point and by guess we have drawn the path between initial and final points. That is why this is denoted by dotted line. So, will it always remain outside the saturation line? No. It depending on the exit condition, it may be inside the two-phase dome, it may be outside the two-phase dome. 
but always there is an in increase in entropy that is why there is a tendency to go to the superheated region, but it is not necessary that always it will be in the superheated region. So, <coughs> as we can see that ideally the exit point is here, but practically the exit point is here which is <coughs> having a higher entropy, one can define a nozzle efficiency. So, we can define a nozzle efficiency. efficiency of steam nozzle. So, eta n, eta n it can be defined in different ways. One can take the ratio of actual velocity divided by the ideal velocity as your nozzle efficiency. And if we do that, you will get h i minus h e divided by h i minus h e s that becomes the nozzle efficiency. So, <coughs> h i is known and well probably the nozzle efficiency value that will be provided. So, taking the what are generally <coughs> supplied from the from the nozzle design point of view are like this. For the nozzle inlet and back pressures are known. So, these two are known alright and again inlet condition condition generally in the terms of temperature is known. So, inlet and back pressures are known, inlet condition, so generally the inlet temperature that is also known. Then, nozzle efficiency is given. So, nozzle efficiency is also given using above equation, using above equation one can find, one finds exit condition. So, using our equation, one can find out what is the exit condition of the nozzle that will be in the <coughs> that will be in the in the pressure same pressure line, but that will have a higher <coughs> higher entropy value compared to the inlet of the nozzle. So, this is how we can find out the efficiency of the steam nozzle and this is applicable this, <coughs> this is applicable or the previous equation where we have determined the nozzle velocity, outlet velocity from the nozzle. So, these are applicable, the same equations are applicable for both convergent nozzle and convergent divergent nozzle. We do not have different equations for them. Only 
it is important to know that convergent nozzle has got some limitation and this limitations can be extended in case of convergent divergent nozzle. So, in steam turbine we will see that in number of places this convergent divergent nozzle is used to increase the mass flow rate and to have high velocity at the outlet of the nozzle. So, that is all for steam nozzle. So, we think we will be able to analyze the nozzle or solve some problem on the nozzle <coughs> using the formula which we have given. Now, <coughs> with this we can go to the basic steam turbines, basic types of steam turbine. One of them or the most basic type of them is known as impulse turbine. So, which type of turbine we will call impulse turbine? We have seen that in a turbine basically energy conservation takes place in two different stages. One is the nozzle and another is the blade passages or bladings. Now, if the turbine design is such that change of pressure of the steam takes place only in the nozzle, then we will call it an impulse turbine. So, we can write that change of pressure takes place only in the nozzle. So, <coughs> steam pressure that changes only in the nozzle and then in the blade passage what happens? there is change of momentum. Okay. So, <coughs> let us see how does a what is the working principle of a impulse turbine. We have to take a new page. If we see if we want to understand the basic working principle of a impulse turbine, let us think of let us think of a nozzle and a blade. So, this is a blade and we have a nozzle like this. something like this. <coughs> so, let us keep the names. The blade is moving in this direction. Now, <coughs> the nozzle is fixed and the blades, we are just showing a cross section of it there will be large number of blades, they will be mounted on a disc or a drum and then as the drum is rotating, the blade will also move along with the drum. So, we will have this is the velocity of the fluid relative velocity 
this is the absolute velocity of the fluid and this is the V B, this is the linear velocity of the plate. That is how we will have relationship between different velocities. And this diagram, this is a triangle, this is known as velocity triangle. Now, there are different angles, this angle is denoted as alpha 1, this angle is denoted as beta 1. So, <coughs> we can write V 1 absolute velocity of fluid at inlet. V R 1 relative velocity city of fluid at inlet and V B is the blade velocity. All right. Similarly, on the exit side if we see, so the fluid is entering like this, it is gliding over the or moving over the blade surface like this. All right. As it is doing like this, there is a change of momentum. Either only the direction of the fluid or both the magnitude and direction of the fluid are changing. So, there is a change of momentum. Okay. So, the fluid is coming out like this. So, this is your V R 2 relative velocity at the exit of the blade. This angle we call as beta 2. So, if this angle is beta 2, this angle will also be beta 2, <coughs> beta 2. This is again this is V B, this is also V B, that is the blade velocity and then this angle, sorry this vector, this velocity is the V 2, that is the absolute velocity of the fluid at the exit <coughs> and this angle let us denote it by delta. So, <coughs> you can write V 2 absolute velocity of fluid at outlet V R 2 relative velocity of fluid at outlet and V B blade velocity. So, I think one should be very much conversant with this figure because this is the basis of our understanding and analysis of the working principle of a turbine. The arrangement is like this, let me tell it once again that in a turbine, in a steam turbine, we will have alternate arrangements of steam, sorry, steam nozzle and blades. Okay. So, here only I have shown one nozzle and one blade that too in the cross section. So, only one blade has been shown, but there will be large number of blades mounted over the drum or disc. 
which will be connected on a shaft. So, steam will pass through the nozzle, when it will come out of the nozzle, it will come out as a high velocity jet. That is what we have discussed so far, that is the sole purpose of using the nozzle. And then this high velocity jet will impinge on the blade. Okay. So, when it is impinging on a blade, the, it will move over the blade passage and there is change of momentum. So, the blade, see the fluid momentum that will be <coughs> transmitted to the, uh, to the blade passage or some amount of force will be exerted on the blade passage and the blade will move. So, then another blade will come and that will get then the supply of steam again that will move a third one will come. So, this continuous rotation will, <coughs> will go on and ultimately from the blade the motion will be transmitted to the disc and shaft from the shaft we will get the output. So, that is how it works and if we have to do some analysis we have to see how the fluid velocities are changing, what are the different component of fluid velocity and here what that is what we have drawn. So, <coughs> we have drawn the section of the nozzle through the nozzle with some velocity the fluid is coming. That is as the nozzle is fixed, so the velocity with which fluid is coming out of the nozzle that is the absolute velocity of the fluid at the inlet. So, this is denoted by V1 and it makes an angle alpha 1 to the tangential direction. So, this direction if we call it the tangential direction, so it makes an angle alpha 1 with the tangential direction or with the direction of blade motion. Though the blades move in a circular path, but for the small amount of time with which it is in contact with the fluid we will assume that it is having a linear motion in the direction given by the arrow V b. It is not having linear motion, but for the small amount of time during which the fluid jet or the steam jet is impinging on it, it is having a linear motion and the direction of motion is in the arrow direction of V b. So, <coughs> the absolute velocity V 1 at the inlet makes an angle alpha 1 with the direction of motion or with the linear direction of motion of the blade. This is also called the tangential direction. All right. Now, <coughs> from this diagram we get V r 1 is the relative velocity of the fluid that means with this velocity it comes inside the blade passage and moves through the blade passage. Now, in the blade passage there could be frictional resistance. Due to that when the fluid will come out of the blade passage it may have a different relative velocity which is V r 2. This V r 2 with V r 2 it is coming out and then in this direction, this is the motion of the blade V b. So, V r 2 plus V b that will give the absolute velocity of the fluid from the blade. So, this will be V 2. This beta 1, it is known as the inlet blade angle and beta 2 is the outlet blade angle. So, what are the inlet blade angle and outlet blade angle? Inlet blade angle is the angle between the tangential velocity and relative velocity at the inlet of the blade. Similarly, outlet blade angle is the angle between the relative velocity and the tangential velocity at the outlet. So, these are beta 1 and beta 2. In most of the impulse blading, you will have identical values of beta 1 and beta 2, though it is not mandatory, but it is a common practice to have identical values of beta 1 and beta 2 for impulse turbine or impulse blading. Now, 
from these two velocity triangles this is known as inlet velocity triangle and the other one is known as outlet velocity triangle. So, this is inlet velocity triangle. and this is outlet velocity triangle. We can get lot of other useful informations. So, <coughs> what we do? We go for a composite diagram of this inlet and outlet velocity triangle like this. Okay. If we see these two <coughs> velocity triangle, one thing is common between them that is the V B. So, keeping V B same, we can superimpose these two diagrams. This is V B. we will have this is your beta 1, this is your V r 1, this is V 1 and this is alpha 1, well, let me write it alpha 1 here and this is V b. Right. And then we can have the other diagram. This is V R two. <coughs> this is V R 2, this is V B and this is V 2. Okay. And <coughs> of course, we have got this angle that means, this angle as delta. So, here also we can have this angle as delta. <coughs> and we can have this as beta 2, this is the inlet blade angle, this is the outlet blade angle. Then we can have different component of the velocities projected on both So, we can have different component of velocities projected. <coughs> so, let us say if we project <coughs> this V 1 along this line. So, what it will be? So, this is V 1 cos of V <coughs> 1 cos of alpha 1. So, this one is your V 1 cos of alpha 1. All right. Similarly, this quantity, this will be V 2, V 2 cos of 180 degree, 
minus delta. So, this can be written as V 2 cos of 180 degree minus delta. Okay. We can have on this plane, this is V 1 sin of alpha 1. V 1 sin of alpha 1, V 1 sin alpha 1 and here we can have V 2 sin of 180 degree minus minus delta. Now, all these quantities which I have denoted, they have some physical significance and they are important in the analysis of the performance of this blade. So, I think we have to continue this in the next lecture and we will, I think we will preserve these few diagrams and we will continue with this diagram in our next lecture.